Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Welcome, Weirdos. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode, we'll look at a phone booth in the Mojave Desert that is supposed to be haunted. We'll dive into the mysterious disappearance of the Eileen Moore Lighthouse Keepers, and we'll learn from members of the military about encounters and experiences they just can't explain those stories, and a whole lot more. So bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. History from what I understand and have heard, the phone booth was in the beginning set up in 1948 to provide telephone service to local workers and others living in the area in an obscure location. The Mojave phone booth, as it is called, is located off the corner of two remote dirt roads. I'm sure most used at one time by lost travelers before the invention of the GPS. Somehow, the phone booth became a hot topic on the internet in the late 1990s when the number was given out, and soon fans started calling and taking camping trips to the desert to answer the phone. There were call lists kept by fans and recordings of their conversations. I understand the road leading up to that booth was worse than the Trail of Tears but campers, RVs, and sightseers went that extra mile to visit it up close and personal. There would be crowds of up to 20 people fighting the desert heat and the blazing sun to get a chance to answer the next incoming phone call. Rumors of aliens calling Earth by means of the Mojave phone booth derived from calls made by a man identifying himself as Sergeant Z from the Pentagon present. Amazingly enough, the phone booth has long since been removed. Only cactus, snakes, and insects remain. Thousands of visitors travel from all over the world to visit the booth or the bare space where it once sat for so many years. In 2006, a movie was made about this telephone booth. Numerous YouTube videos are posted. I first heard about this phone booth on a late-night paranormal call-in radio program. Callers shared captivating stories and claims of religious experiences to conversations with aliens answering that phone. Ma Bell sold the phone booth number to a few different companies. The area code changed a few times. It is now a party line so that when you call, you can select a number and talk to one or several people on the line at one time. I called the next morning after hearing about the haunted phone booth. There were several people talking over and to each other. I only listened. I didn't converse with them. It's amazing how one lonely phone booth sitting in the desert for years busted out glass, bullet holes, the door missing, providing shade for snakes and lizards, becomes a source of so many myths and legends. I call at different hours to see who might answer. So far, I've had no luck, only getting the recording. However, don't hang up. It will ring several times before you're asked to select a number. Who knows? The next voice you hear might say, take me to your leader, or I am the voice of your dead Aunt Gladys. Area code 760-733-9969. I dare you to make that call.
On December 26, 1900, something strange and unexplained happened on the largest of the Flannan Islands, Elan Moor, Scotland. Three lighthouse keepers disappeared into the night, never to be seen again. Their mysterious disappearance still baffles historians and scientists. The three lighthouse keepers, Captain Thomas Marshall, James Ducat, and Donald MacArthur, vanished on the island without a trace, leaving only speculation behind. A small ship was sent to the Flannan Islands in the remote Outer Hebrids. Its destination was the lighthouse at Elan Moor, named after St. Flannan, a 6th century Irish bishop who later became a saint, the island was completely uninhabited apart from its lighthouse keepers. The ship carried supplies and a change of crew, but due to the storm, this was delayed. When the ship arrived at Elan Moor, there was no sign of the three lighthouse keepers. Captain James Harvey, who was in charge of the supply ship, blew his horn and sent up a warning flare to attract attention but there was no response. Under normal circumstances, someone should have been waiting at the front of the lighthouse to welcome the ship. It all seemed very strange. The interior of the lighthouse itself was as it should be, with oil in the lamps waiting to be lit and ashes in the grate. The only thing which appeared out of the ordinary was the two sets of missing oil skins, the outdoor gear the keepers donned, only one set remained, belonging to Donald MacArthur. Obviously, he had gone outside in a ferocious storm in just his clothes. This was not only unheard of, but also illegal. One of the rules of the Northern Lighthouse Board was that one man always must remain inside the lighthouse. So why did he leave the lighthouse? Captain James Harvey quickly sent back a telegram to the mainland which in turn was forwarded to the Northern Lighthouse Board headquarters in Edinburgh. The telegraph read, A dreadful accident has happened at Flannan's. The three keepers, Ducat, Marshall, and the Occasional have disappeared from the island. On our arrival there this afternoon, no sign of life was to be seen on the island. Fired a rocket, but as no response was made, managed to land Moore, who went up to the station but found no keepers there. The clocks were stopped and other signs indicated that the accident must have happened about a week ago. Poor fellows, they must have been blown over the cliffs or drowned trying to secure a crane or something like that. Night coming on, we could not wait to make something as to their fate. I have left Moore, McDonald, Bowie Master, and two seamen on the island to keep the light burning until you make other arrangements. Will not return to Oban until I hear from you. I have repeated this wire to Muirhead in case you are not at home. I will remain at the telegraph office tonight until it closes if you wish to wire me." A few days later, Robert Muirhead, the board's supernatant, who both recruited and knew all three men personally, departed for the island to investigate the disappearances. His investigation of the lighthouse found nothing over and above what Moore had already reported, that is, except for the lighthouse's log. Muir had quickly noted that the last few days of entries were unusual. On the 12th of December, Thomas Marshall, the second assistant, wrote of severe winds, the likes of which I have never seen before in 20 years. He also noticed that James Ducat, the principal keeper, had been very quiet and that the third assistant, William MacArthur, had been crying. What is strange about the final remark was that William MacArthur was a seasoned mariner and was known on the Scottish mainland as a tough brawler. Why would he be crying about a storm? Log entries on the 13th December stated that the storm was still raging and that all three men had been praying but why would three experienced lighthouse keepers safely situated on a brand new lighthouse that was 150 feet above sea level be praying for a storm to stop? They should have been perfectly safe. Even more peculiar is that there were no reported storms in the area on the 12th, 13th, and 14th of December. In fact, the weather was calm 
and the storms that were to batter the island didn't hit until December 17th. The final log entry was made on the 15th of December. It simply read, Storm ended. Sea calm. God is over all. What was meant by God is over all? Investigators concluded that two of the men must have been outside during the storm and were swept away by the waves. Donald MacArthur then ran out to their rescue but was also swept away. But even the official investigation was mere speculation, as no proof to this story has ever appeared and the explanation left some people in the Northern Lighthouse Board unconvinced. Many are still wondering why none of the bodies washed ashore. It is simply as if the three men walked off the island never to be seen again. Over the following decades, subsequent lighthouse keepers at Elan Moore have reported strange voices in the wind, calling out the names of the three dead men. Several speculations have emerged, but the fact remains, the mysterious disappearance of the three lighthouse keepers remains unsolved. The patient awoke alone in a narrow bed. Not knowing where he was, he peered through the darkness around a small, cramped room, seeing only the bulk of a cupboard, some curtains and a blanket folded over his chest which he immediately brushed aside. He felt neither hot nor cold. Not even the hum of an appliance connected him with his unaccustomed surroundings. He thought he might call out but doubted anyone would hear him, so dense was the silence. How did I get here? he wondered, sitting up. A collage of unconnected images flashed before his mind like the sudden disjointed memories of a night of heavy drinking. Then one night, clear memory exploded, one of utter pain. Another memory floated up from the depths for just a second, only to be as quickly wiped away. Of his mother, she was telling him in her most comforting voice that pain, no matter how great once passed, cannot be remembered. But she was a woman and no doubt had been speaking to him about the pain of childbirth, from which the wisdom of the race, that vast, blind force that guides all protoplasm towards survival and procreation, shields mothers with forgetfulness, so they willingly repeat the act to continue the species. He recalled his pain exactly, and it made him shudder again, just as he had in its grip, relentless, total pain, pain that forced him out of his mind to observe himself. Yet the part which had separated could not escape the pain, and two bodies, one a web of defenseless nerves below, the other a phantom drifting above, writhed in searing twin agonies pain that occupied a period outside of time in which a split second was an eon and a minute of such was incomprehensible, as it is incomprehensible that a point which consists of no dimensions set alongside a multitude of other points forms a geometric line, for there could be no continuity in a world of such monstrous pain, only the one infinite present. He shivered and looked down at his body, now horrified to see it wrapped in white bandages like a mummy's. Had he been burned from head to toe? Had every bone in his body been shattered? Why couldn't he remember what happened? And why was he here all alone? In a black rage, he clawed at the lengths of cotton, unraveling them first from his forearms, grabbing fistfuls from around his chest then yanking free his head and finally pulling away those that encircled his legs until he stood with his whole body stripped and nothing was left. Darkness merged with darkness and the small, cramped room in the narrow bed vanished. No matter the time of day or season, 
Sometimes you need to find a way to rid yourself of those ghostly chills that bring raised hairs and goosebumps to your skin. Other times you're looking for those ghostly chills. Either way, it sounds like you need a mug of Weird Dark Roast Coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee has deep notes of cocoa, caramel, and a touch of sinister sweetness that'll send shivers down your taste buds. This is an exclusive coffee that I selected specifically for you, my weirdo family. Weird Dark Roast is not available in stores, coffee houses, mad scientist labs, or even the dark web, but you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee – fresh roasted to order so it's as fresh as it can be when it lands on your doorstep and knocks three times. Grab yours now at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee does not actually knock on your door because it doesn't have arms or hands, so if you hear knocks at the door and no one answers when you ask who it is, it's probably paranormal and you should just leave the door shut and locked. Every time I come home, I unlock the door, put down my handbag, and put my keys inside a small wall cabinet with hooks inside. I ask myself, why am I doing this still after all these years? Then I promise myself I will learn to keep my keys in my handbag or on a table like everyone else and take down that key cabinet. By bedtime, I change my mind. I just don't know how to live normally. I've had to learn to keep close track of my things and not to leave my keys or important papers lying around. After the life I endured in that house, no way can I ever be like anyone else. That place burned scars into my soul. It makes me do stupid things out of fear and from bad experiences. No kid should lose their happy childhood trying to figure out what is happening in their home. It was built on a large tract of land from before the Revolutionary War. It was very large, gray stone, had three floors and a basement, and as my Irish mother said, they got it cheap. Large trees surrounded the home and huge, old flowering bushes. We weren't wealthy but to live on the mainline suburbs of Philadelphia, close enough to Valley Forge State Park to have a view of it, was enviable for a family like us. My dad said it was an historical home. Wealthy people built it many years ago, and it had been improved with additions and updates. My dad had enjoyed working around the house, so I figured he had plans for the place. It had very high ceilings, a very large, heavy front door with iron hinges and bullseye glass on top, large planked wooden floors, and fireplaces that I could stand inside of at the age of six. I remember my little brother was two, and my dad said he would fit into the black iron cauldron in the fireplace. The old fireplace tools were still in front of it, and various black pots hung under the mantel. The kitchen fireplace was just as large, but our stove was inside it. The other fireplaces were either boarded up or bricks put inside them and couldn't be used. It had bumpy walls, built-in window seats with hideaway shutters on every window, and built-in hutches and cabinets for glassware. It seemed to have endless doors, though. Every room, hallway, closet, and alcove had a door. It had plenty of windows that made everything look kind of distorted when you looked outside. It was bright, and plenty of light came in during daylight hours. It had a lot of windows in each room. Very quiet area. We were totally surrounded by trees, and no roads were nearby. No street lights and a very long driveway. It had a sunroom, or glass greenhouse built on two seemed we could be happy there and there would be plenty of fun to be had. However, the basement was off limits. My dad said the steps were too narrow and rotted and he had to build new ones. Only access was through big, heavy outside Bilco doors. We didn't need to go there anyway. The house was huge. About two months in, it was still summer and we finally were settled. The days were spent exploring the area and the park. Creepy place, that park, especially those small, tiny cabins. 
Evenings were even more creepy and noisy. It didn't feel safe. It should have been quiet except for night wildlife noises, but it wasn't. It always sounded like people were trudging through the woods and talking softly. We told my mom these things and, of course, our good old Irish mom would yell and say, stop acting like you just saw a creeping Jesus. We buy a house in a very nice area and you kids are ungrateful. So much for the noises. So we are scare babies, I guess. We never brought it up again. We made sure we were inside well before dark. We would run upstairs with flashlights and shine them out the windows and watch the grounds at night, looking for the source of the talking in the woods. We never saw anything but still heard the talking. Our doors were so big and heavy and hard to open, with big deadbolts installed, so no one could get in anyway. We just didn't go out after dark. When the fall came and we started school, my dad who worked night work did renovations and repairs during the day. It was then that things changed in the house. At night when we went to bed, my mom, myself, and my brother, we would leave the hall ceiling light on. It gave us comfort. The way the house was laid out, you had to be careful you didn't take a wrong turn and fall down the stairs. The light made us feel safe. We could see what was happening, if anything. The murmuring would start around 1.30 a.m. It was very audible from upstairs, but you couldn't tell if it was humming or talking softly. I clearly remember listening to it and then dozing off every blessed night. By morning light, it would stop. None of us ever went downstairs to see what the noise was or even mentioned it for a long time. I do recall that our dog would lie on the bed and listen too. I did happen to mention it to my dad once, and he told me that very old houses make settling noises that you hear when things get quiet. He said radiators and the wind against the windows and through the trees make noise too. It's normal stuff. Ignore it. I filed that in my brain for future reference. Every night, the same murmuring at the same time, for the same duration for all the years we lived there. Okay, old houses do that, and ours was really old. Amazing what one becomes accustomed to if you live with it long enough. We didn't realize yet that house was different. It had a life of its own. Finally, in fall, the stairs in the basement were done. My dad fixed the place up, installed some small windows, and made storage shelves, tool benches, cleaned it up and waterproofed it, and even vacuumed all the cobwebs. It was immaculate. Except one area off in a corner of the basement had a stone room of some sort with a big wooden door, giant iron hinges, and a wooden latch. It had to be very old. On the outside of the old door were drawn and painted plus signs. Some even looked like upside-down crosses. There were old twigs and old herbs hanging around the door, and on the door there were words written that you couldn't read anymore. Some of the dried herbs were lying on the floor. We stood there looking at the door, and before we could open our mouths to ask what it was, my dad said, "'Stay away from that door!' You need not go in there. There's nothing in there. That is where they used to store their food many years ago. There's no business for anyone to touch that door. Next time you're down here, sweep up the sticks and leaves, but do not touch the door. No problem, I thought, as it smelled awful by that door. We both backed up away from the door and left the cellar. At dinner, we discovered that was our new play area for the winter months. Well, the winter came and to the cellar we would go. My brother and I hated this house with the talking dining room, walking woods, and the old plus sign door that hid a secret room. We swept the floor and sat down about two feet from the door and wondered what all that stuff was on the door and why it was there. Grandma had hanging herbs in her kitchen, and she had another stove in her cellar. That had to be it so we would play and not pay too much mind to that door, 
except seeing if Dad had opened it yet or not. Every time we went down the cellar, once we did notice that light was shining in the basement from behind that door. Outside, I ran and noticed there was an opening or a window of sorts where the sun would shine in at winter time. I ran back relaying the news to my brother and we proceeded to find anything long enough and thin enough to put under the door. Suddenly, the Bilko doors opened and there was my dad. Fortunately, I pushed the yardstick under the edge of the door so it couldn't be seen. We acted like we were playing until my dad went upstairs. We hightailed it to the door, lay on the floor trying to find the stick, and the yardstick wasn't in sight. That's impossible. Where did it go? Dad didn't take it. We were there the whole time and none of us went near the door. I was one upset, confused, scared kid. My little brother started screaming at the top of his lungs and I told him I was just fooling him. Anything to shut him up. Outside we went. Cold snow or not, no cellar. Something isn't right down there. This house wasn't right. The yard wasn't right. It was then I started saying prayers I made up every night to protect us from that house. Christmas. Our first holiday in that house. Things were happening that we couldn't explain but always got blamed on my brother and me. The car, house, garage keys disappearing, doors left open, windows opened, the Christmas tree knocked over, cabinets opened, dishes broken, doors unlocked, water running, doors slamming shut, lights turned off and on, stove on. We all had things that disappeared and were not found. The heat either turned off or up high and the interior basement door wide open more often than not. Good old Irish mom always blamed us kids and it wasn't us. We would watch doors open and close, be together when we heard it. Some rooms were so cold and even with a space heater you could see your breath and there would be frost inside the windows. Sometimes, if you sat in the dining room, it seemed that the air got stuffy and thick. Many a holiday company would always go on the porch and get some air. My dad bought a bench for the front patio because everyone would have to leave the dining room. As kids, we ran through there, not walked. It was that creepy and the air was that heavy. Time passed slowly in that house. We kids were always punished for things we didn't do. Nighttime was when the house woke up. We were having a miserable childhood. It was like we had night dwellers who were living in the house while we were supposed to be sleeping. It had constant noise and movement all night. Our parents never mentioned a thing and if we did, we were ungrateful kids. Nothing we could do but live like that and ask for night lights for Christmas and fortify our rooms. The night dwellers didn't seem to walk up the steps to the upstairs. Their territory was downstairs. Naturally, my adolescence was spent in my room, away from them. Little brother slept in our parents' bedroom that was huge and had a sitting area with a couch. He claimed people were in the attic crawl space and would walk around his room at night and hide in the closet. I believed him. No one else did. He slept on the couch in my parents' room. Once in my teens, I spent weekends and summer doing little jobs to earn money. I was able to spend less time at home. I would feed the pets of vacationing neighbors, water their plants and bring in their mail. This was when I realized that other people's houses don't make noise like ours does. The houses weren't quite as old as our house, but they were quiet. Nothing banged or moved by itself. No murmurs, creaks, or groans. No ice-cold rooms in the summer. I told my brother about my discovery and he didn't believe that it was possible. I had to find out about this. Why is their house quiet and why was ours so noisy? 
I would make regular trips to the library to try to find books about very old houses. I read all I could get my hands on. Didn't seem to help, though. Then one day I was sitting there reading, I was home alone at the time, and I thought I heard someone walking up the cellar steps. I ran to the window. No cars in the driveway, so that meant no one was home but me. At the time, we were having a really bad thunderstorm. So frightened and alone, I went out and sat in the leaky greenhouse. At least I could see them drive up when they finally came home. They arrived after dark. I sat huddled in the corner where they found me. I told them what I heard in the basement. My dad made my brother and I follow him down the steps to the cellar. We had been avoiding that place. My dad took us around the cellar, and there we saw he had painted that ugly wooden door and had taken down all the herbs. He even had the hinges off the door and the old-fashioned lock apart. Now the door was just leaning into its doorway, and it had an old chest of drawers against it. We were shocked. I remember thinking that someone was in that room. Once we saw that door like that, we ran up the steps into our rooms. I knew that something was wrong with that basement and that house. Three days after that, in the middle of the night, I heard footsteps downstairs. Very slow, heavy footsteps. What was odd was that there was no murmuring. If something happens regularly, I guess the routine brings comfort. This person was slowly walking around downstairs. I lay really still and listened. I could tell where they were by the loudness of their steps. They were getting closer to the staircase and can come up here. I softly yelled to my mom to see if she was awake. No answer. I was so scared I was shaking. I called the dog, but the dog crawled under the bed a while ago. My bed fit into an alcove that had pocket doors, but closing them would make too much noise. Instead, I scooted all the way over in my bed with my back against the wall and waited. I didn't know what I was waiting for. I lay really still and covered my head just enough so I could see out under the sheet. I started praying and crying quietly. Step by step, the person came upstairs. He was coming up very slowly. My mom and brother had to hear him. This guy had a heavy foot or heavy shoes. I could hear the dog whimpering. It seemed like hours, but it was only minutes when he reached the top of the steps and stopped. I took a breath and waited and listened. He was coming toward my room. I waited and watched. I couldn't move or breathe because he would see me. He was so tall, he blocked the light from the hallway coming into my room. He was dressed funny, stunk, and he had boots on that were up to his knees. He walked over past my bed and to the other side of the room and stood facing away from me. He had a hat on his head. It looked like a bishop's hat. His jacket was long in the back. It looked like sleeves were white near the hands. He only stood there a minute or two. I have no idea what he was doing or looking at, but I noticed he kind of had a bluish glow around him. Not really bright, but he glowed just the same. Is it a saint from heaven? Finally, he turned back around and I saw only his eyes. They glowed red. I couldn't tell if he was looking at me or not. I held my breath as it started walking out of my room. I didn't move in case he came back. Over to the steps he went, down the steps slowly, one at a time. I tried to move, and I couldn't. I was stiff from lying so still. I listened as he walked downstairs and over toward the kitchen. I ran into my mom's room and woke her up. I was hysterical. Good old mom didn't see or hear a thing. Little brother didn't either. Did this man want to get me? He was as solid as any human being I ever saw. 
He had a glowing blue outline that was like the blue flame from a gas stove burner that was on. His eyes were like two red lights. Then it dawned on me again that his clothes were odd. What was that? Did he break in? Was he a killer or a thief? The next day, I stayed in my room. I was so tired. I didn't go to school and I didn't eat. I wasn't sure if I had a bad dream. I would go over it and over it in my head. Who was that? What do they want? I waited until my dad woke up and asked him to take me to the library. I started looking in books for different kinds of dress. No luck. Then I remembered that our house was built before the Revolutionary War. I started looking at clothes from that time. Then finally I found it. The man had been wearing a Prussian mercenary uniform from the Revolutionary War. I couldn't figure out why, but at least I matched up what he had been wearing. I checked out that book. He killed soldiers to earn money. I would show good old mom who I saw. I waited until Saturday. I cornered my mom and said I had to tell her something. I showed her the pictures, rehashed my experience, and crying gave her every detail again and waited for a response. Nothing. She got up, went to the living room, and came back with an old book and some old papers. The book was by Hans Holzer about ghosts. The papers came with the house and had drawings and instructions on them. They were clear instructions not to open the wooden door in the basement, as it had been sealed by a chaplain after it was exercised or cleansed. The small basement room was built to house prisoners that were captured. I was so angry that my mom didn't tell me this when I first told her about the night visitor. She claimed she read all about ghosts and to ignore this ghost if I see it. She said, don't be afraid of the dead, only be afraid of the living. Good old mom made it perfectly clear that we can't afford to move and we cannot tell a soul about the ghost. No one would buy our home if they knew it was haunted. She explained ghosts can't hurt you, they're only looking for something, so don't acknowledge them when you see them. She also said the wooden door is back on that room in the cellar and a priest is coming to bless that room and the whole house. I started to ask about the murmuring and banging doors and was told not to mention anything about any of these happenings again. It would scare my brother. Besides, the priest will fix it this week. Sunday after church, the Monsignor came to our house. He didn't want to enter our house. My mom dismissed my dad and brother to the woods and started explaining what we've been through. He listened as he put on his vestments and grabbed the holy water and rosaries and started walking through the house. He stopped in the kitchen. Basement first, he said. Once he got down there, near that room, he said he could not help us at all. He was the first one up the steps to the kitchen. He rushed to get his coat and told my mom we never should have opened that door. Out the door he went. I watched him leave the driveway in a cloud of dust. I looked at my mom and waited for an answer to what just happened. She said that nothing could ever be as bad as the orphanage was, so learn to live with what you are given. When you're old enough, you can get and pay for your own place to live. At that moment, I realized we were stuck there. No way out. No one to tell. Nothing to do about it. We were all stuck in this house of the dead, where you couldn't sleep. There was constant movement. You couldn't keep track of your things or have any peace. There I lived until I left home at 17. I worked my butt off to get my own place that was quiet, where I can have friends come visit where things won't disappear and doors won't slam. No night visitors to my room. A safe place where I can sleep through the night. I saw that soldier about 15 times while still living there. He would always come upstairs and do the same thing. I would watch him and wonder what he was looking for. 
My brother saw him during the evening once, and he locked himself in the bathroom. That was bad. My parents had to call the fire department to get him out. My brother is just as scared as I am. Night lights in every room, as many locks as you can fit on a door. Must be tougher for a guy to explain that to his friends. Once we moved from that house, we never spoke about it. Funny thing, we don't have any pictures of the outside or inside of the house. All of the pictures never turned out. There were always giant dust particles, rays of light taking up the whole picture, or they would have smoky mists in front of everything. Important milestones were lost. These are the things our kids will never see. After I left home, I tried to put all these experiences out of my mind. They were scary and painful and a stigma was attached to them. It was impossible. Every time I moved, and I moved a lot, I would wonder what I would find lurking in my next home. It used to take me so long to find a place to live. Finding a home is very stressful for everyone and compound that with fears of a haunting. The home I live in now took me over 10 years to find. It's hard to explain night lights all over and bolted doors when you live in a perfectly safe, family-oriented small town. Locking up your house keys, rosaries over doorways and on walls, crucifixes in every room, religious statues all over the house, and a library filled with 16th to 18th century English literature and ghost books raised a few eyebrows over the years. I became curious why some dead don't rest. I still try to find out why that ghost had red eyes, what he was looking for, and what happened to him. Does he still wander the floors at night? After so many years, do they pass over? I'm told the house is still there. I'm almost 50 now. That makes that house over 200 years old. I'm told by my friend it is still lived in and looks the same. She said our light fixtures are still hanging inside. The same trees and bushes are out front. She was the only person that I ever told about that house. We're still in touch, and if I don't ask if it's still there, she will volunteer the information. I thought it may have been torn down to make room for casinos near Valley Forge State Park. I hope that poor soldier found peace. I have prayed for him over the years. I've also prayed that no child ever lived in that house after us. It robbed us of so many things. No one should ever be afraid living in their own home. It's your safe place and your shelter from the world. Living in fear robs you of a lot. I've learned through the years, though, there are just as many lost living folks that are on a quest looking for something as there are ghosts looking for peace. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. This experience still puzzles me, even now. It happened when I was still young. I woke up at 2 a.m. since I needed to use the comfort room. As I was going to the comfort room, I looked at the door of the living room. The living room had a wooden door and a curtain. At that time, the wooden door was open and it was dark in the living room. Looking at the curtains, I saw two pairs of feet like there are two people standing behind the curtain. I did not mind it, thinking they were only my parents, so I went to the comfort room then returned to my room. On my way back to my room, the feet were still there. In the morning, I asked my parents what they were doing standing behind the curtain. They looked confused and said they were sleeping at that time. 
This is when I started to think, why the hell would somebody stand behind the curtain at 2 a.m.? The curtains are made of thin cloth with hole designs. If someone is standing behind them, you should see his body from the other side. But at the time, I saw the feet under the curtain. I never noticed a person standing behind the curtain. The feet standing there were not attached to a body. Even now, when I remember this experience, I still can't come up with any explanation as to where those feet came from. Whose feet were they? I work in the public affairs office of the Armed Forces of the Philippines General Headquarters in Camp General Emilio Aguinaldo. Our office space and barracks are in the grandstands of this military base. Although the building is kept new by recent renovations and good maintenance, it is very much haunted. Since our office caters to media and the military 24-7, we have people working night shifts. Although we sometimes feel and hear things during the day, it is during the night that weird stuff happens. Personnel who work the night shift would sometimes hear the loose tiles of the floor near our boss's door clatter as if someone is walking circles or pacing at the dead of the night. No one is ever there if the duty personnel are brave enough to check and the sounds cease as soon as the lights are switched on. One duty personnel woke up to the sound of someone noisily typing at the desk computer of the research branch one midnight. Again, no one was there. Months later, I came to work in this office, and that computer was issued to me. I shiver as I remember that I am writing this story using that same keyboard that he heard being used by invisible hands that night. Our oldest personnel narrated that he almost had a heart attack when he was taking a bath at the office comfort room. He said that when he looked at himself at the mirror over the sink, he saw someone else staring back at him. He never described the face he saw to us because he could not remember it anymore. All he could say was that it was a young face. One of our former officers and Army Major once said that he was spooked by shadows moving around near the supplies room. They would always be just in his peripheral vision. They disappeared whenever he tried to stare straight at them. Since we have no choice but to work with these ghosts, we just dismiss their presence as part of the experience of living in a military base. They might have been soldiers themselves who died fighting for our country or had loved their jobs so much they chose to remain soldiers even in the afterlife. When I was still in elementary school, around 1995, our classes were only half a day, so I would go home and stay there alone until my parents returned from work, which wasn't usually until 6 in the evening. Each afternoon, as I watched television alone in the living room, I would always notice the silhouette of a black lady going up the stairs. I only saw her out of the side of my eye, and when I looked at her directly, she disappeared. At first, I thought this was just my imagination or probably something wrong with my eyesight. One day, as my older brother and I were playing and telling stories, he mentioned that sometimes he would notice a black lady-like shadow going up the stairs and eventually vanishing. That's when I realized that what I had been seeing was not simply my imagination. Since that point, whenever I was alone at home, I would go hang outside or ask my friends to play in our house until my parents came back. As I grow older, the black lady's appearances have become less and less frequent. Or maybe it just came out of my mind. Until now, even when I stay alone at home for days, the black lady is not appearing anymore. But I can't say that I miss her.
I was young when I first started seeing ghosts. The first time was when I saw a woman wearing a white dress whose hair covered her whole face. I thought that would be the first and the last time, but I was wrong. That was only the first of my many encounters. I can feel them and sometimes see them, but I have never experienced talking to them and I don't want to, that's too scary. Anyway, this one particular experience haunts me the most. I was still in college when this happened. Our house is one of those that survived World War II. Yes, it's ancient, and the furniture is ancient, too. I share a bed with my sister, and one night, while we were sleeping, I was awakened by a whisper. Someone was whispering to me. I was so scared, but I still opened my eyes and saw a woman's face near mine. I tried closing my eyes, but she whispered to me again, telling me that she wants to trade places with me. I tried to ignore her and silently prayed for this ghost to leave me alone. After some time, she just disappeared. I prayed again and was able to sleep. The next morning, I told a friend who also has the ability to see ghosts about what happened to me the night before. She then accompanied me to our house when I went home. After doing some inspections, she found out that the ghost was from the ancient closet of my great-grandmother. The woman's spirit was trapped in the mirror of that closet, and she really wanted to take over my body and to trap me in that mirror. My friend says that I was lucky she didn't succeed. After that, we switched rooms with my aunt and I'm relieved that the ghosts didn't bother me again, although I still feel her sometimes watching me. We moved into a new house around 10 years ago. From the first day, I thought it was haunted. I have heard, seen, and felt things that you can't explain away. My husband thought I was going insane until the day he was up late watching a football game. He turned his head and a big, old black man was looking straight at him. He now believes me. One night, I woke up in the middle of the night and I instantly felt as though I were not alone. I could feel it in the air. I couldn't fall back to sleep, so I decided to watch some TV. Even though I was wide awake, I could not get out of bed. It was as though my body was still asleep, but my eyes were open. Eventually, I managed to get out of bed and I went downstairs. It was insanely quiet. No clocks ticking, no creaking, nothing. All of a sudden, I saw the man I presume my husband saw walk through the door. I could see him vividly. He was carrying a lit torch and he walked through the damn door. As soon as he left, I could hear the clock ticking and the sound of the wind outside. It was freaky. My dog spends a lot of time staring at the walls. My sister saw a man, a different man, looking back at her from a mirror. My mother won't stay at the house since she was woken up by a man screaming at her to get the F up. My niece was taking care of painting a room in the house while we were on vacation. She said that she was told by an elderly black man to leave the house and that she wasn't welcome. She called me later that day to ask me who was in the house and we had no idea nobody was in the house. My father said that one time he actually asked if there were spirits there and to give him a sign. A door slammed shut and he was told to leave. That's proof enough for me. My father is a big six-foot ex-miner. He will not visit us anymore. Has anyone else had experiences like this? I was taking a routine drive into town one morning. It's about two miles and it's a woody road that is spotted with a few houses. We often have fogs and mists that roll in as there are several lakes in the area. 
That morning, a mist was rolling in, but I didn't take any notice. It was routine. I had gone half a block, pretty slowly, when I saw a light in the fog. I thought it was another car with its headlights on, but as I got closer, I saw a market that I hadn't seen before. I pulled in to get my groceries and I was marveling at the fact that this new market had been built so quickly. I went inside and remarked about how quickly they had built the place. The manager looked at it and answered that the market had been there for 40 years. I asked him where I was and he told me I was in a place that just happens to be on the other side of the country. I checked my watch and I'd left home about 10 minutes ago. I have no idea what happened, but I do know that it took me two days to get home. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. All stories in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find source links or links to the authors in the show notes. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Colossians 3 verse 2 – Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. And a final thought – tell the story of the mountain you climbed. Your words could become a page in someone else's survival guide. Morgan Harper Nichols. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness.